Good morning, everyone. Yes, indeed, we do get to uh, um, continue in our book of Acts, and we get to find we get to one of the the grander passages in the book, or one of the one of the chapters that's most studied because it's one of the more interesting ways that uh, people have used to kind of understand. Um, uh, Paul uses a totally different strategy now when he reaches out to a different group of people. So that's what we're going to look at today. We're going to look at uh, just as Paul is moving through, the, through Europe, as Paul is, is, is trying to bring this gospel message everywhere, uh, what we find is that when he meets a new group of people or, or, or he, he meets you know, uh, uh, even familiar people, he has to adjust how he's going to be giving the same gospel message to, to, to everyone because not everyone is capable of receiving it the same way. And so this is a, a time in the book of Acts when we see that, that Paul is now preaching the gospel to people who really don't have a Christian background. And the question that, 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 that we're going to be looking at is, well, how does, how does Paul do this? How is he going to communicate uh, a message of Christ to them when, when people don't have a background in Christianity? And more specifically, when people are already religious. You know, uh, so that's, that's something we're going to look at today. And it's fascinating how even though um, that may be the case and, and, and people are set in their ways, how God is still able to open doors even in something that's, that's as difficult as this, when someone already has a belief system. So that's what we're going we're gonna to look at today. So before we begin, uh, uh, just join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word, how just wide and how magnificent it is, and how wide and magnificent you are, Lord Father God. And there is nothing that is going to stop your gospel message of Jesus Christ. Uh, no belief system, no way of, of persecution is going to, going to stop this message from happening. And we thank you that you show us through, through Paul, Lord Father God, that um, missions and, and ministry is very diverse and, and it can't be done the same way all the time, Lord Father God. And it always behooves us to kind of adjust uh, the way we see things according to the, the, the people that we meet. And we thank you that Paul gives us an example of this, Lord Father God, so that we're not using um, just the same methods over and over again uh, uh, ineffectively but that we're able to meet people where they are, Lord Father God, while still giving them a real message of who you are and, and why it is that you uh, sent our Lord Jesus Christ to us to begin with. So we thank you, Lord Father, for that, and we thank you for your, your book and acts, Lord Father. May we learn from it. May your Spirit give us wisdom and knowledge in this. And especially, Father, may it transform our hearts. We praise you and we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Here we are in, uh, in our little uh, the map here. Um, well, we see that we were in Thessalonica, Thessalonica up there, Berea's over there, and now you see Paul is now in Athens, where the region of Achaia is. Athens is down there. Uh, he has to go by way of sea in order to get down there. So that's where Paul is at this point. Uh, he has to go by night to Athens. And the reason why he has to go by night to Athens is because people are after him. You know, they don't like the gospel message, or at least they don't like the way Paul presents the gospel message. So in this case, um, the Jews, some of the Jews are after him, and so he has to, he has to escape and, and, and go to Athens. Um, and so that's where, that's where he's at right now, and that's where we are in the book of, of Acts. Um, so <clears throat> what, is, what is Paul to do in Athens uh, while he's, he's, he's waiting for Silas and, and, and Timothy to come join him? Um, you know, when it comes to someone who's like an ideal worker or an ideal student, you know, uh, an ideal worker that you want to hire or an ideal student that you want to work with because you know they're going to not fail you on group work, um, you know, there's no better example of this kind of a person than, than Paul, Paul himself. Um, as you just said, Paul had to leave Thessalonica in, in secret. Um, uh, because he was about to get dragged into the courts and who knows what will happen to him. Maybe he would get pr in prison like he did last time uh, in, 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 in Lystra or maybe he would get stoned. We don't know. But in any case, the, the new believers of the city, they hid him and they, uh, they, they, they got him on a boat to sail him all the way down to Athens. And while Paul is, Paul is going through this, he knows... He, or someone tells him that, you know, this new believer named Jason, you know, the first time we read in the Bible that a Christian is being persecuted, we read that, that the Jason and other new believers, uh, because they can't find Paul, they drag Jason and his friends instead, you know, to, to, to the courts. And they, they beat them, right? And so Paul's going, oh my gosh, the gospel message is now, it's, 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 it's getting real, folks. You know, uh, uh, people are getting beat now for this. It's not just me who's getting beat. You know, Christians are starting to get beat for this message. And, and, 
And Paul, you know, on his way down to Athens, he does this, this covert secret thing. And he says to Silas and Timothy, and he says, hey, you guys did not make anybody mad. You know, and we have new Christians in, in Thessalonica, and they need to know uh, what the gospel is about. So I'm leaving you guys behind, okay? So stay low key, you know, while I run away to Athens. And he, he leaves his, his co-workers, two main co-workers behind, not knowing what's going to happen to them in case they get caught, in case they get found out, right? Like how sometimes people explain their experiences in China when, when they're preaching the gospel and the government comes and you know, you know, they're flushing everybody out. Well, Paul's doing the same thing with Silas and Timothy. He's saying, you guys stay, but, but don't make a lot of noise. Just teach the people. And, and, uh, and you would think that when Paul is running to Athens, he's saying to himself, you know, I'm, I'm overwhelmed with ministry. Man, I, I need a break. You know, I have, just, I have just given a message that's gotten people in trouble, has gotten people beat. Uh, I've had to leave my coworkers there. You know, I don't know what's going to happen to them. And Timothy's so young. You know, he's not used to this mission stuff. And Silas is, is, is a great guy. But, uh, uh, you know, who knows, who knows who's going to turn them in? You know, and, and, and so Paul's thinking, you know, maybe, maybe I need to stop this. Maybe I need to stop doing missions. I need to stop. I need to take a break. Um, and I need, a, I need to reassess my life, right? My, I need to reassess my life goals. This is not being very effective, you know, in, in ministry. But what we see in, in Acts chapter 17 is that, is that the opposite, in fact, happens. And in fact, Paul tends to grind on that he's a very tireless worker for the Lord. And, and despite all these troubles, despite these, these risks, despite putting his own co-workers in, in jeopardy and, and watching new believers get beat, um, Paul is still adamant in saying, you know, but nevertheless, this message has to go out so that people will know who, who our Lord Christ is. And so Paul is in Athens and he's waiting. We saw at the, the end of, of, of uh, chapter or the the last parts of the first parts of chapter seventeen. He's waiting. He's waiting for uh, for uh, Timothy and Silas to join him because he wants to hear like, well, did the church survive? Is everything okay? You know, he's he's waiting for them. And so while he's 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 waiting for him, maybe just you know trying to decompress from what has just happened to him. He's walking around the city of Athens, and all of a sudden he gets the inspiration again to say, you know, but even though I'm tired. Even though this message is, is a very scary message to tell people, um, there's a lot of people in Athens who still need Christ as well. And so Paul continues to keep busy by getting to know his surroundings. In fact, if we were just to examine this one section in Acts, Acts chapter 17, verse 16 to 34, just these, these, these 15 or so verses, if we were just to look at him, we would see that <coughs> while Paul was in Athens waiting for Silas and Timothy, uh, one commentator noted that Paul went to three different places while he was in Athens, while he was waiting. Uh, that is, Paul went to a synagogue. Paul constantly went to the marketplace or the, or the agora. If you ever wondered, you know, you're in business, you ever wonder, what, what is the agora? Why do they keep talking about the agora? It's, it's basically Greek for the marketplace. He went to the agora, he went to the marketplace. And also, thirdly, he went to, he went to the university or he went to a government building or, or he went to the uh, epitome of philosophy in all of Athens, the Areopagus. Uh, to talk about Christianity. I mean, the guy was busy, right? Synagogue, marketplace, Areopagus, it doesn't matter where you send me, I'll go tell the gospel to, to, to anyone and to everyone. So one of the things that, that we can learn from Paul, even, even just from that, like we said last week, is that, that Paul, Paul never wastes opportunities when he's given a, a chance to preach, when he's given a chance to talk to people uh, about the goodness of Jesus Christ. Paul always takes it. And that's something that we see happens even now. Yes, the gospel message can be scary. Yes, there's a price to pay for following Christ. But it still needs to go out to people because ultimately salvation is, is what, is what will, will be the reward for those who, who stay persistent in the faith. And, and Paul says, because of that, I cannot stop giving this message. So we read in Acts chapter uh, 17, verse 17 to, to 20, this is how Paul is keeping busy. Paul reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons, and in the marketplace, the agora, every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. This is the intelligentsia. This is the, the intellectuals now. Right? And some said, what does this babbler wish to say? And others says, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him into the Areopagus, saying, may we know what this new teaching is that you're presenting? For you bring some strange things to our ears, and we wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. And you know Paul, Paul's never going to turn down an opportunity, especially when he has an opportunity to save somebody's life. 
So what is highlighted in our passage today is Paul's opportunity to debate the intellectuals, right? We've, he, we've talked about him talking to people in the synagogue and talking to people in the marketplace, but what our, what our passage wants to focus on today is what happens when Paul gets an opportunity to debate intellectuals, to debate the, the smartest philosophers, the, the smartest religious people of, of the time um, who happen to be uh, non-Christian, you know, they don't have a Jewish background. What, what's Paul going to do now? And, and we are, are, are faced with this potential dilemma that now Paul must overcome. And, and, and so what will happen to us, because we are Asian and we are geared towards the universities, we will find ourselves in this exact same situation. And the potential dilemma is this. How do you evangelize to someone who is already religious? Or how do you evangelize to someone who already has a philosophical mindset and they already have their core sets of beliefs in place? Right? Can you imagine talking to your, your, your biology teacher who is already a proponent of evolution? How do you evangelize to someone like that? Or how do you evangelize to, uh, uh, um, I don't know, uh, other scientists or literature majors, you know, who, who, who don't believe that there is, is truth at all, that truth is always in flux, you know, and there is no one truth, and truth is only a perspective. How do you evangelize to people like that who have already set up within their minds, you know, a core set of belief systems, and it's a very sophisticated belief system that you will now have to simultaneously knock down in order for you to convince them? How do you do it? Right? How do you do that? Well, when we take a look at Paul's approach to evangelism in Athens, the first thing to note, the first thing to note is that when Paul is looking at this city, um, he knows it's a very religious city. But the first thing he notes, and the, th the first thing we need to understand, is all religions promote the good of mankind. It doesn't matter what, what kind of religion you're looking at, all religions promote the good of mankind. Just like when you go to a university, every field that's in there, okay, whether it's the humanities, sciences, engineering, all fields are geared towards the good of society. We just have to take that as a given. Otherwise, why do they exist, right? I mean, you don't see a university saying, our whole goal is to destroy the world. You know, you don't see that, right? It's the whole goal is to benefit society. So we, when Paul's in his place, in his, in his context, he needs to understand that all religions are meant for the good of society as well. All religions, at their core, they recognize good and evil, okay? And, and, and all religions, just like all universities and all intellectuals, they are geared towards leaning towards the good, right? They're, they're, they're geared, lead, leaning towards the good. In fact, this even applies to Satanism, okay? Satanism. Now, you would think that the number one tenet of Satanism, when I was looking up the, uh, the tenets of Satanism, I was looking up the Satanic Temple, you know, you would think that the first thing they would say is, well, you must be able to boil your children or eat them alive. You know, you'd think that that would be one of the tenets, right, of Satanism. But the mission of the Satanic Temple is four things. They have a, they have a mission, and they, this is their mission, uh, according to the website, they, these four things. Number one is to encourage benevolence and empathy among all people. Number two is to reject tyrannical authority. Number three is to advocate practical common sense and justice. And number four is to be directed by the human conscience to undertake noble pursuits guided by individual will. Those are the four great tenets of Satanism. Okay, so what I'm trying to tell you is all belief systems, right? You know, whatever it is, it's, it's geared towards the good. Nobody is saying, yes, our... Uh, you know, we advocate, you know, just um, doing harm to the world or, or killing everybody. No one is going to, to, to say that. Um, and, and so Paul just has to understand that when he's dealing with Epicureans and he's dealing with, with, with Stoics, maybe one way to start being able to evangelize to them is to grant the fact that they are trying to do good in the world or that they are trying to live according to some good principle. Okay, and that's something that we ought to learn too. Instead of always debating everyone, oh no, you know, since you're not a non, since you're a non-Christian doctor, I don't think you know what you're doing. Or since you're you're you're, you're a non-Christian structural engineer, I don't believe this building will stay up. You know, maybe we ought to just kind of just say, <clears throat> look, to understand that a we do consult non-believers, the, and and their whole intention is not always to 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 make everything collapse or or to destroy you. That there is uh, that there is good that can happen, and that that their their field of study is not for no reason. And, and, and people develop philosophies because they're trying to live rightly. And, and maybe one way of dealing with them is to not always try to knock it down. 
So we see that the Epicureans and Stoics were no different. So when Paul begins his debates with the Epicureans and the Stoics, Paul has to know something about the Epicureans and the Stoics in order to understand what the good is, in order to understand what their common ground could be. And, and for the Epicureans, you know, before the Epicureans, before that whole philosophy, you know, devolved into unbridled hedonism, you know, hedonism was just like self-pleasure, you know, everywhere. You know, before it devolved into that, or people used it for that, um, which is what, what Freud basically did in, in, in the 1800s, before it devolved into that, you know, that, that Epicureans, the reason why Epicurean kind of philosophy started, and I know Douglas is probably going to give me a lecture after this, you know, but I, I try to do my best in, 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 in figuring this out. But the reason why Epicureans kind of, kind of uh, evolved to begin with is because they were actually trying to answer a legitimate question. And that was, uh, what is, uh, how, how does the problem of evil exist? And they came up with three kind of, kind of questions that they were asking their people. They said, look, if God existed, if God exists, why is there evil? Because assuming that God is good, right? If God exists, why is there evil? Um, and so they're trying to answer this question. If God exists, why does evil exist? And so their three answers were this. Either, either God is not powerful enough to stop evil, so that means God is weak, right? Or, or God actually approves evil, and that means God is spiteful, right? But... But their third solution was this, and they weren't really happy with it, but I think this is, where they, they, this is where they landed. They said, but if God is powerful enough to stop evil, he is powerful enough to, to stop evil, but at the same time, he doesn't want to stop evil, okay, well, what can we say about this God? What can we say about this God? That there is a God who exists that is powerful enough to stop evil, but yet has not stopped evil. What can we say about him? And their answer then was this. Well, you know what? It just means that we shouldn't follow this God, quite honestly. You know, he's, he's, he's not doing humanity any benefit. And so what we will be is we will be atheists. Because then they reason to themselves, because this God doesn't really care about human matters. Uh, so that's why this God allows evil to run rampant. And this God is not the source of evil. He just doesn't care enough about human beings, and so he just lets evil go its own way. So, so in response to this, the Epicureans said to themselves, well, what are we going to do about this? Well, first of all, we're going to become, uh, we're going to take an atheistic stance towards God. And atheism does not mean a disbelief in a God. Disbelief in a God. Atheism does not mean a disbelief in a God. Okay? Atheism basically means, I just don't respect God. I don't care what he is. I, I don't care what he does. I don't care who he is. That's, that's what atheism is. You know, I just, don't, I just choose not to live by him, right? And so, and so by not respecting, so they said, so since God is not going to solve our problems of evil, we ourselves as humans, we have to solve our problems of evil. And what they said to themselves is that in order to solve this problem of evil, well, the, the best way we could do that is we can make ourselves happy. That means we could pleasure ourselves. We could pleasure ourselves. And that's, that's where this pleasure thing came from, essentially. Um, so what they were trying to say to themselves was they were trying to say, you know, the, when, when, when humans, when they are under a god, when they are under a religious system, two things happen to humans. First of all, they're always chained by fear. They're, they're very fearful, okay? And second of all, they, uh, they always undergo, like, bodily pain, right? You know, you look at all religious systems. Don't eat this. Don't do that. Blah, 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 You know, hit yourself 20 times a day. You know, it's like, and so, you know, um, that's just what religious systems are to the Epicureans. You know, it's, it's, it's fear and it's bodily pain. So, so their solution was, you know what? The best way to eradicate fear and bodily pain is to seek happiness any way you can. Any way you can. And that's where the pleasure principle came about, right? Where that Freud later exploited. So I will do anything I can to make myself happy. Because this God doesn't care about me, because uh, he lets evil run rampant, and because, you know, anyone who's under religion uh, tends to be, you know, fearful and always, you know, uh, in pain, you know, I'm going to do just, just make myself happy any way I can. And that's kind of what the Epicureans believed. Um, they, they rejected authority. They rejected religious rites. They rejected worship of God. They didn't even worship the, the, the Greek gods, you know, all 400 million of them, you know, right? They, they didn't care. Okay. So that's on the one hand. The Stoics, on the other hand, they were, they were built on a completely different system than the Epicureans. They were actually almost opposite of the Epicureans. You see, Stoics, they, acknowledged, they also acknowledged the existence of God, but this is how they dealt with. This is how they dealt with God. The Stoics said, you know what? If you are going to be good in society, if you are ever going to be happy in society, the best way to be happy in society 
is to conform yourself to God's divine will. That means, to, and also to conform yourself to any natural law that happens. That's the best way. It's not to just say, oh, I'm going to pleasure myself and be absent of God. The Stoic said, no, no, you know, to be happy of God, you just do God's will. Just do whatever he asks you. But this is kind of where the extreme of Stoicism comes in. Okay? Um, they also believed um, that whatever happened to you, you just had to resign yourself to it, and you just had to say, oh, well, that's just fate. That's just, that's just what God sent. Okay? You just accepted it. So, so here's an example. So if fate meant this, if fate meant that you did a lot of hard work in school or you did a lot of hard work at, at your workplace uh, and then one of your classmates comes in and steals your work, you know, they plagiarize all that and turn it in before you turn it in or, or someone steals the credit at your work and they get credit for the project that you're working on, then what you do is you just accept it. You say, ah, oh, but that's just the way, to the, the way of the world. Uh, it was fated to happen, so that's just what happens. If someone is raped, if someone is murdered, if someone is slandered, if someone is beaten, if somebody is abused, if somebody is shot, if somebody is blown up by a bomb, what you do is you say to yourself, that just happens. That's just the way of the world. That's probably the way God wanted it anyway, since God preordains and He predestines everything. In fact, this is, this is, and this is how the Stokes justify it. In fact, the Stokes said, you know, if you are to understand that just weird things happen in this world, and if you remain emotionless, like you don't get drawn into your emotions, you don't get too angry, you don't get too upset, you don't get too joyful, but you also get, don't get too depressed, but you just logically see that just things happen, you just accept it, they said, you will be the happiest. You will be the happiest then. You know, uh, your friend hates you, you know, says bad things about you. Hey, don't trip. You know, just, just understand that people get mad and, 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 and don't get upset and, and you will be happy, you know. Um, basically, in other words, they promoted emotional repression. Um, but Stoicism does have a, have a pretty good asset. You know, Stoicism also included this, you know. And if you want to stay even keeled, you know, the best thing in your life right now, if you're a Stoic, if you want to really stay even keeled and not get too emotional one way or the other, one of the best things you can do for yourself is that you don't, you, you, you don't get yourselves in situations in which there's going to be a lot of fear or a lot of regret for yourself. That means you don't become enslaved to anything so that you remain truly free. So, for example, if someone breaks into your house, you know, you can say to yourself, well, I had too much stuff anyway, right? Or, or if someone punches you and breaks your nose, you say, well, at least I could breathe out of my mouth, right? If, 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 if you do these things, these th you will not be affected, and you will be truly free in this world. Um, and and if, if you also, if you want to make sure that you are never affected by emotions, you know, you know this is one good tenet of Stoicism. They, you know, uh, they, they, they promoted, you know, look, just don't buy fancy things. Don't get caught up in consumerism. You know, if you like, you know, if, 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 if you're always so worried about wearing your, um, your Supreme hoodie sweatshirt, you know, that costs you $4,000 because you're scared of getting it dirty or you're scared of someone like uh, taking it or, or, or putting a stain on it, you know, go to Walmart and buy a $4.99 hoodie, right? And then solve your problems. Right? Then you don't worry anymore. Right? That's, that's their kind of mentality. If, if, you, if you're so scared of getting your, 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 nice, your nice Ferrari stolen, your nice car stolen, don't buy a Ferrari. So there were kind of tenets to this that, you know, it, they kind of make sense, right? So you can't like outright dismiss it at all. And Paul realizes this. You know, you know but so, so what, they, what, they, what they taught was emotionalists to be a supreme, to have a high supreme understanding, of, uh, uh, have a high supreme, I guess, um, ethic of apathy. As long as I'm apathetic towards every, anything, I show no emotion, I will be the happiest in life. Nothing can move me because I am a rock, right? And rocks don't care about anything. In short, Epicureans, they advocated pleasure as a means to getting the most satisfaction out of life, while the Stokes, they advocated apathy as a means for getting the most satisfaction out of life. So armed with this knowledge, this, this belief about the Epicureans and the Stoics, and then Paul knowing what he was up against, like, man, this sounds like a major university, even today. That's how people think. Man, they really do, you know? Um, Paul formulates a two-part strategy, two-part strategy to maximize evangelism in Athens. 
And the first of all, Paul did this. First thing Paul did was this. Paul did not dispute the beliefs. He didn't dispute the beliefs of the Epicureans or Stoics. He didn't say, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. He didn't, he didn't bother doing any of that. Okay? He, he knew that, that for whatever reason, you know, they were stuck in a system and some things did work in their philosophies, even though they're very different. Some things did work. So he didn't dispute any of this. He didn't dispute their view of the, of the religious world. He didn't, he didn't try to argue it. But the second and most important thing he did, and this is what we really are going to be learning today, is that rather than, you know, uh, rather than, than uh, um, disputing everything somebody believes, Paul says, I'm going to do this instead. I'm going to correct their view of who God is. I'm going to correct their view of who God is. And um, by correcting their view of who God is, he's going to show how Epicurean philosophy and Stoic philosophy, how they both are inadequate to satisfaction in life. So Paul abhorred, he abhorred their gods. He abhorred idolatry, okay? That is, he's disturbed by the culture of idolatry. Acts chapter 17, verse 16. Now while Paul was waiting for Silas and Timothy at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. You know? But the thing, at the same time, even though he was provoked and he was like, ah, I hate this idolatry, Paul does not discredit any of their gods. He does not discredit any of, the idol, uh, any of their idols. Um, and most importantly, Paul did not discredit their belief systems. He let them hang on to it. It's important sometimes. And you know, this is important for you guys too. You know how, you know how Chinese parents think sometimes, right? It's like a one-way track. You just got to get married. You got to get money. You got to get... Sometimes it's better not to fight the belief system. Don't fight the belief system. Understand that there is some good to it. Just figure out how to navigate around it, okay? And we can talk about that later. That's the discussion. But it's the same kind of thing. When someone has a belief system, sometimes it's better not to fight it. Don't fight it. Figure out how you can redirect it, okay? So um, Paul knows that if he goes into a foreign place and he immediately criticizes the people, he immediately criticizes the cultures and the customs and their way of life, he will have no Christian witness. Paul knows he will never be influential in Athens. So instead, Paul spends his time studying the culture of Athens. Paul decides to use his knowledge of Greek uh, literature and philosophy to highlight and to explain the gospel in a way that does not put down the culture, but maybe reinforces certain aspects of the belief system. That's what Paul is going to do instead. Uh, so Paul shows eventually um, that, look, some of your belief system actually aligns with Christianity. But then before Paul says, but this is how your system falls short according to God. Okay? But what Paul is going to do is he's going to say, let me show you how Christianity kind of aligns with what you're thinking. Okay? I will convince you of that first, that Christianity is legitimate because you believe the same things before I show you the inadequacies of, of, of your belief system. That's what Paul is going to do. And to do this... Paul first has to find a way to get into their culture, and he does so by speaking on behalf of the unknown God. Acts chapter 17, verse 22 to 23. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God, what therefore you worship as unknown, this I will proclaim to you. Paul says, I will give you a name to your unknown God. Right. Next, once Paul finds a way into the culture, he says, ah, oh, I could talk about the unknown God. Once he finds a way into the culture, Paul is able to show not only how Jesus meets their cultural beliefs, but also how Jesus surpasses their, their cultural beliefs uh, entirely. Paul then gets an opportunity to explain, you know, who this God is and what he's done for humanity. Acts chapter 17, verse 30 to 31. You know, the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, and of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Now, it is assumed that in this passage, uh, what Paul did was he talked specifically about the name uh, of the son of the unknown God. We don't know, okay, because Jesus is not mentioned once, but we're assuming that if Paul got a chance to speak, he would tell him that the son of God, his name is Yahweh, and he, and he has a son named Jesus Christ who requires all people to repent of their sins in order to be saved from, from the righteous judgment of God our Heavenly Father. That's what Paul would have told him. However, the most important thing Paul does in evangelism, the most important thing he does, is that he shows 
how the beliefs of the Epicureans and the Stoics, how those philosophies or those ways of living, how each of them are so inadequate uh, on their own. And the reason why they're inadequate is because their outlook on life, their religion, it has a warped sense of the majesty of God. In other words, the reason why your belief system will never work is because the God that you believe, Epicureans, the one who is distant from everyone, and you Stoics, you know, the God who just fates everybody and says, that's it, no negotiation. Paul says, your view of God is too small. Your view of God is way too small. And let me tell you who this God really is. So in Acts chapter 17, 26 to 27, Paul says, I'm going to tell you who this God is. You think about God way too small. You think about it from your own perspective. You don't understand the real perspective of God. Acts chapter 17, verse 26 to 27. Paul says, the God I'm talking about, he made one man, uh, he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth. And he, and he he's determined a lot of periods and boundaries of their dwelling place that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way towards him and find him. And, and he's actually not far from you at all. Paul disputes the notion of the Epicureans that God is distant. Remember, the Epicureans thought God is just letting evil run rampant. He doesn't care about us. God disputes the notions of the Epicureans um, by saying, first of all, look, God made mankind from one man. He cares about you. Second of all, he determined the times and the places where you live. He knew when he was going to birth you. He knew where you were going to live. He put you in this area in Athens. He didn't stick you in like Africa or Israel or anywhere else. He put you in this place. He cares about you. He's involved in your life. And third of all, and he desires that you come seek him. Epicureans, your view of God is way too small. Your view of God is distant and not involved. It's not true. Paul says God is intimately involved with mankind, that God is not some distant, esoteric God. You know, he's not just a spirit being wandering. He's actually involved in human life. Furthermore, by saying in Acts chapter 17, verse 30, the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent, Paul again is saying to the Epicureans, you know what? Evil will be addressed by God. Don't you worry about that. God will address evil. And, and, and while God is not the source of evil, God is going to deal with evil in his own time. So don't worry about that. Don't think that God has to handle it according to your, your philosophy of how God should do it. God will handle it. He's going to handle it. That's why everyone needs to repent, because judgment is coming. Okay, it's not just this person who sins, this person who sins, that person who sins, but it's you, you yourself have sinned. And God is going to handle this. Just realize that God will take care of sins. Furthermore, by saying in Acts chapter 17, verse 28 to 29, In Him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for indeed we are His offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. Paul is now arguing to the Stoics. Paul is arguing to the Stoics saying, Look, you know, it's, it's silly of you. It's silly of you to believe that God is made out of silver, stone, or gold. And, and basically, God is made out of the imagination of man. It's silly for you guys to believe that. Do you know why? It's, it's silly because gold, silver, and stone, they are blind, deaf, and dumb. They have no power to predestine. They have no power to predetermine anything. More specifically, your own poets have said, your own people have said, your, your own poets that, that you worship, you know, They've even said that you are offsprings of this God. Are you trying to tell me that you are an offspring to, from a piece of gold? Are you trying to tell me that you are the child of something that's made out of wood, hay, or straw? If you are, your God is too small. And uh, I don't know, I guess I can call you Woody or something. I mean, who, who, who are you an offspring of then? If you're an offspring of, of God, why do you worship things made out of stone, wood, hay, clay, whatever? Your view, Stoics, <clears throat> that this God is fatalistic, this God does this, you have no conception of what that is. If you are an offspring of God, that means you're a child of God. What kind of father treats his children as if, oh, do this, do that, do that, do that, no argument. What kind of parent is that? The Stoics do not have the best outlook on life either. Because they, they, their view of God is also too small. An offspring, Paul says, you know, a, a, an offspring of a powerful, living, creator God, Paul says, you know, in, instead, needs to obey God for, for, for his own good. 
You know, your life is not a result of fatalism. Your life is not a result of predestination or, or, or uh, um, foreordination in the way you think about predestination, okay? It's, it's not the way you think about it. That if, if you saw uh, that, 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 that life is to be lived, it's not to be apathetic. This God loves you. This God bore you as a child. This God wants you to, to, uh, to, to experience it all. So, if you're a Stoic, if you see there's evil in the world, it's okay to speak up and to fight against evil. It's okay, right? You don't just let evil happen. You don't just let evil happen to, to, to other people and just watch by and say, oh, but that is the way of the world, you know? You are not here to be apathetic, to be emotionless to evil that's around you. If that's, that's, if, if that's your God, your God is too small because that's not my God. My God cares about that kind of stuff. Because even the one true living creator God, even he is opposed to evil and he will punish people who do evil. He's very emotional. I don't know who you worship. Yeah, if you're worshiping a rock or stone, yeah, that's, that's pretty good because that's pretty apathetic. It won't give you any emotion in one way or the other. But if you worship the living God, you will see that he is full of, of justice, anger, but also mercy, love, compassion. It's all emotion. In other words, when Paul is doing this, Paul does not condemn the Epicureans. He does not condemn the Stoics for their beliefs. Paul's ultimate evangelism strategy is to point out how their beliefs fall short. And they fall short because they see God too short. Or they, see, they don't see God how he really is. Simply put, Paul argues that the God of the Bible it surpasses not just Epicurean and Stoic thinking, but Paul says the God of the Bible surpasses how Epicureans and Stoics live out their lives. It is completely ridiculous to live out your life in self-pleasure all the time. It is completely ridiculous to live out your life completely apathetic, never showing emotion to anything. <laughs> you won't get far in either, in either, in either system. Right? Happiness is not achieved by either pleasuring oneself, it's not achieved by avoiding emotions. Happiness is living a full life under the guidance of an almighty God who not only loves us, but has given us a good purpose in life. That's Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 to 10. It says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That's the God I worship, Paul would say. A lot bigger than who you think God is. Right, so our bottom line is that we can learn a lot about evangelism for Paul. For example, when it comes to our mission trip this June, right, we're going to go to Kaleo Missions in San Diego, one of the things we should be doing now, if we were to really take kind of Paul's teaching to heart, is we should be, we should be thinking about who we're going to be serving. That's what Daniel keeps saying. You know, now we know who we're serving, you've got to start thinking about them. There are Somali you know, refugees that are Muslim. Well, there are homeless people that have been drug addicted. They have specific core beliefs and views of life. And we need to understand who we're talking to. Uh, so, so we need to start figuring out what Islam is. We need to, we need to start, start figuring out like, what a specific a Somali Muslim believes. Right? We should be, saying, uh, you should be asking ourselves questions. What cultural cues should we, should we watch out for? You know, maybe it's not going to be effective for you as a single woman to be talking to Muslim men. You know, so you're going to have to adjust your whole ministry and say, okay, then I'm going to be talking to, 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 to the women, the children, and other, other single, single ladies, and, and maybe married women. I, I just need to know that about, about you know, Islamic culture. You know? or, or, or sometimes, how do they like to receive information? You know, we didn't ask ourselves that. You know? Hey, you've got to believe in Jesus. Well, you know, <laughs> I was going to say hi, but you know, now I don't want to deal with you anymore. You know, we've got we to gotta understand how we're going to approach this population if we're going to you know, evangelize to them. Furthermore, when it comes to evangelism here in Fremont, California, well, we can also understand, well, what are the culture beliefs here? And like I alluded to, we, we already know some of the things that, that people are obsessed with. For example, we know that there are a lot of people here, and it doesn't matter whether you're Asian anymore, but because you know, the Asian influence is just, you know, just infested all of Fremont, to Indian populations, even Caucasian populations, African American, it doesn't matter. And, and, and those, those thoughts that pervade People are, everyone's always concerned about money, everyone's always concerned about education, everyone's always concerned about their kids. Well, how do we use these things, like Paul did in Athens, how do we use these things to reach out to our community, knowing that our community is obsessed with these things? 
I know what will get you. You know, I know what, if I have a conversation with you, you know, I ask you how you doing. You know, you say okay, fine. You know, you turn away. But if I ask you how your kids doing, oh, let me tell you, they're failing in school. You know, you got them. You got them. Just knowing, understanding what you're dealing with. Every, every parent likes to talk about their kids. You know, just ask them about their kids. Don't ask them how they are. Just how are your kids doing? Oh, let me tell you. You know, and there it goes. Right. We don't always have to discount people's beliefs. I know what, I know what Asian parents tell their kids. You gotta make a lot of money. You, you, you gotta get a good job. If you're gonna go to church work, you can think about church later. You know, don't go into, don't go into ministry. You know, that, that's just a losing proposition. But, you know, engineering is good. I know that. But what I try to tell people is don't, don't discount the belief. Don't fight against it. Understand that it's said for a reason, and it's best to let, let them keep their beliefs. But sometimes the best strategy is to show God is bigger, though, and God is better. Yeah, engineering will sustain me, but what happens when the layoffs come? You know? But when I have a correct view of God, when, 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 I see, when I'm able to explain how God is, is involved in, in all of our world, and God is bigger than just a job, and God is bigger than just getting married, and God is bigger than just you know, getting a house, you know, and I'm able to explain that, then everyone's views of who God is expand, and we understand that oh, we're living for something more than just that. The most important aspect we learn from Paul when it comes to evangelism for him, that it is vital, it is vital that we, we ourselves, we have a right view of, of who God is before we evangelize. Because whoever we think God is, if we think God is small, that will be the same God we describe to someone else. Yeah, God is just a part of your life, but he's not the main thing of your life. Right? If that's what we believe for ourselves, that's how we're going to explain it when we evangelize. Yeah. Work first, God second. Right? That's how it is. If we don't have a right belief of God ourselves, we won't be able to modify or correct someone else's belief about God. I tell you, the Muslims also have a belief about God. And do we know how to counter that? Do we know how to explain why their understanding of God is not reflective of the true creator God that Paul was talking about? Do you know why? If we don't have that belief ourselves, we can't explain it to anyone, so we can't even correct their, their worldview of who God is. When we ask ourselves these questions, well, how do we evangelize to a people? Maybe it's a religious people. Maybe it's a scientific people. How do we evangelize to a people who already have their own sets of core beliefs about God? Well, the answer is that we better make sure that we have the correct biblical view of God ourselves first. We need to understand who God is. Otherwise, we have no, no hope in evangelizing. So as you go to, to a time of meditation and prayer, um, thank you. So you go to a time of meditation and prayer, um, this is what we're, what we're going to do. We're going to ask God to, to allow us to see Him rightly as it is, to, to, allow us, to allow us to see God in all His beauty, to say to God, give me a right view of who you are, Lord. Open my eyes so that I can see you. And the reason why you want to see God is not so you can brag to someone and say, oh, I know what He looks like. He does have two eyes and two ears, uh, two eyes, nose, and an ear. It's not to, to brag like that. It's that when we really get to see God, we can explain to people, God is way bigger than who we thought He is. And, and, and you need to adjust... We need to adjust how we live our lives and our scope in order to serve this magnificent God. That once we have the right view of God, we have the right view of His Son, Jesus who died on the cross for our sins and rose from the dead, who offers salvation from the wrath of God to come to anyone who repents of his or her sins. That, then it will make sense to us and we can see God for who He is. So we praise God for that good news that He is able to give to the world. Let us pray. <laughs>